Honest. All right. Well, welcome to church. Welcome to everyone watching online. We are in part four of our series on prayer. And today I'm going to talk to you about, um, and I call this prayer 101. And we're just going to look at the basics of prayer. We're just going to go over some basics of prayer today and kind of just get a framework and a context. And we'll do that. Um, we'll also talk about an outdoor octagon that I saw in Granite City, and we'll talk about people who cuss when they lift weights. You guys good with that? <laughs> so we'll talk about that today, all right? So, all right, so prayer, as we're talking about this in a context, prayer can bring out um, the most guilt in Christian people than anything else. Would you guys agree with that? And, and I'll tell you where this happens more than anywhere. It's in mature Christians because there's always going to be this voice that says you're not praying enough and you're not doing enough. And this is, that voice is the voice of the enemy. It's the voice of the accuser. And so um, it's the enemy's way of throwing you off and not allowing you to enjoy your Christian walk. I know for me, I grew up in a denomination that was based on guilt. Um, it, it was based on partial forgiveness, not complete forgiveness. Um, it was based on the fact that you're never doing enough for God. And I always felt guilty about being human in that particular um, framework and that idea. I don't know if you guys can relate to that. I'm sure some of you can. And, um, and then one day what happened to me is I was introduced to this gospel. I was introduced to the gospel of grace. Um, the words is, uh, that Jesus said on the cross was, it is finished. And it didn't have anything to do with me. It had more to do with him. Um, and then things began to change. And so there was joy and there was this freedom in Christ and it was Jesus only. And like I said, I grew up in this denomination of do hard or try more and that still was permeated in my soul and I had to fight against that and so there was freedom and joy and um, and we read the verse earlier I think I think we have it up here yes um, John 8 36 and here's what I experienced if the Sun sets you free you will be free indeed um, and that was very real to me there was freedom and joy there's another set of verses I have you guys read these from with me where you're sitting um, and then we'll we'll do a text later on but just read this with me. It's about this church in Galatia. And Paul comes in and what he does is he shares the gospel with these people. And these people walk in freedom. But then Paul, what, here's what would happen with what he did. He would go in, he would share the gospel. It's about Jesus alone. The resurrection was the key. There would be a group of people that followed Paul around. These people were called Judaizers. And what they would do is they would follow him around and then they would go in after him and they would try to fix his theology. And they would say, oh, Jesus, is an, is, that's a good thing, but you still need the law. You still need more. There's not complete forgiveness in Christ. You need to add to it. And so then Paul, he hears about that and he hears that they listen to these people. And this is what he writes. Let's read it. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Does, does this make sense to you? Do you understand what he's saying here? This is so very clear in what we still deal with to this day. We may not be dealing with the law of Moses, but we are dealing with the laws that we make in church that are kind of unwritten, but they are spoken. And that's kind of what I ran into. Um, so what happened to me is I got really on fire for the Lord. Um, I started going to church more and more, but I had no framework for the gospel as a whole. And I didn't really have a discernment for what the gospel um, 
or the new covenant was. And I, I literally, uh, Jen and I would go to any church that was open. I, I was just on fire for God. I just had a radical change. Um, and I would, and that's a bad idea. I'll explain why in just a moment. I remember uh, going to a Thursday morning Bible study with a group of 70 year old women across town at this Methodist church. The pastor, I trained him, his name was John Davis. He goes, oh, we have a Bible study. And I, I would just go because I would just wanted to learn. And I, I just had this hunger for God. And so after a while, here's what happened. This is why this is a bad idea uh, because I went to all these different churches and I think still in this day and age now for us, we have this same problem and I'll explain where that comes from. But I went to all these different churches and I never knew what I really believed because there were so many um, mixed law messages in the middle of the preaching. And, and here's what I mean by that. Um, do good, um, try harder, be better, stop sinning, uh, be happy, um, serve more. And all these things are not bad messages, but they're just laws, they're to-dos rather than to follow what's been done. And I think in our culture, in our society, here's what I see. Someone will come to me, I heard this guy preaching when I was watching YouTube. And I'm like, there's so many messages out there. You're, if you're just searching for a good message, um, all you're doing is feeding the flesh rather than walking things out with the Lord. So it creates such confusion with what people have been called to do. Does that make sense? There's just a plethora of information that can confuse us. So I went through this whole thing and all of those things um, start, they distracted me from what the real message was. And the real message is Jesus alone. And these things aren't bad things. I'm not saying that they are. Um, but what I'm saying is if you make them laws, then you lose the message for what God's called us to do. And I think that happens a lot um, to us in prayer. Um, and here's what happens when you become a Christian, you'll have a desire to do these things. You don't need people to tell you. And so you're led by your desire read, rather than uh, led by law. And what I start noticing in myself and in the people that were around me that all these rules um, and commands, they became, uh, they started coming as bad news for those of us who are trapped in our guilt-ridden lives. And what I mean by that is when you grow up in, in a denomination that uses guilt as a motivation, then you are easy, easily manipulated through guilt. I can recognize guilt a mile away and you can make me feel guilty about anything because that is the battle that I have to fight continually. And there's a verse that I try to remember all the time and it's in Hebrews 10, 22. You guys can write the reference. I don't have it on the screen, but here's what it says. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies wash, washed with pure water. And so what he's saying is that our guilty conscience is taken care of for what Christ has done. And so I think that those types of things that come at us can take us all in the wrong direction. And so anyway, with all that said, um, we're going to look at prayer. We're going to wrestle with some things. We're going to examine some things. I'm going to create questions for you today to think about because I think good sermons don't answer every question. I think good sermons create questions for people to think about. Does that make sense? So um, the final answer is in God's word. And so we're just going to look at things that you probably haven't thought about before, but there are things I wrestle with, okay? So in your notes, the first thing I want you to see is I want you to write this down, prayer as duty. Prayer as duty. And I'll tell you what, just to stay with our tradition, let's stand and read the next two verses together because we've got to stand for the word somewhere, all right? So it's kind of a... Uh, um, that's what happens when you grew up with guilt. You got to just stay with that so it doesn't hit you again. All right, so let's read these, these two uh, these verses. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. 
for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. You guys can be seated. He said, babbling like pagans. And I was listening to a sermon on prayer as I was preparing for this. And I was listening to a guy uh, talk about prayer. And he likes to talk about context and what was the original context of prayer. I think it was really good. But the prayer was the Our Father. And the guy was really good to listen to until he said this. He said, we need to be praying the Our Father three times a day. And all of a sudden, I had this PTSD. It just hit me. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been through this before. Um, and, and I just felt overwhelmed with guilt. Just immediately, I lived that stuff for years. I lived that law, and I'm like, I reject that. I just, I stopped listening. But then, my mind started racing. It led me to a few questions. Um, am I praying enough? Anybody ever have that question? Right? Um, how about this? Three times a day is good, then four times has to be better because I'm compulsive and that's what I do. Um, it's always got to be more. Um, and, and listen, we just studied the prayer of Agar and we just studied the prayer of Jabez, so we better add those. So now I'm at five or six times a day. And then I come across a verse like this that says pray continually. Our, here's, um, it's in 1 Thessalonians. Do I have that one on the screen? Um, Oh, I know that. Here it is. Should I add more prayers to that one? And that was Agar and Jabez. Then I come across this verse and it says this, pray continually, pray without ceasing is one version. You guys understand that? Do you do that? Right? Mm. <laughs> That's what I heard. Mm. <laughs> let me explain something to you. Okay. Let me explain this to you and how this verse works. Christ is in you all day long. So what you're doing all day long is you're hanging out with the Lord. And any time you're with the Lord, you can pray because he's praying for you and he's in you and there's no guilt in this. Here's what he's saying. I'm praying for you. Join in any time you want. This verse is for encouragement. It's not to produce guilt. Does that make sense? Christ is in you, the hope of glory. It is finished. He's saying, hey, we're going to walk this thing out together. And so, um, so he's saying we're connected and I'm going to encourage you that you can just call on my name any time of the day. So, so now let me share a few thoughts about the Our Father that kind of bother me to no end. And I asked this question over the years a lot. I remember asking this question to a, a couple of theologians, guys that were um, really uh, professors, and they didn't have a legitimate answer for me. But in the end of the Our Father, here's what it says. Read it with me. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you. What do you think about that? How does that make you feel? Right? Think about this. Think about the burden of that verse taken out of context for people who've been sexually abused. Think about the verse of that context who, for people who've had their lives stolen from them. I gotta walk around and I'm not gonna be forgiven unless I forgive? How does that make sense? How is that gospel? Well, it's not. This is the law. And here's what Jesus is doing. He's giving them the Our Father. They said, hey, shh, teach us to pray. And he said, pray like this, our Father. And he begins to give a framework and a context of who God is and where he is and, and the sovereignty of God. But then here's what he knows. He knows that people as a whole, he knows what they will do is they will think that they got it down unless they understand that they can't get it down on their own. So he throws this in there, and basically what he is saying is, yes, I showed you how to pray, but you can't forgive on your own. You can only forgive to the degree that you've been forgiven. This is Old Covenant. This is the law. Let me give you another thought. Does it, do you, under, you understand what I'm saying? You guys with me? I know this is a little bit harder to understand, but this is how this works. We're not, we're called to forgive. Jesus always points us into what's going to happen when he says it. Paul says, forgive as Christ has 
has forgiven you. So what happens with Jesus, Jesus is always slowly revealing the grace of God that is coming after his death and resurrection. He's pointing people to what will be. He is both prophet and he is priest. He is priest in a sense where he shows you what you can't do, but he's prophet in a sense of showing you what he will do for you. And that's what he's pointing to. Let me give you another thought. You guys with me? Is that, is that confusing? Are you okay? Does that make sense? All right, so let me give you another thought. I was talking to Terry Cook about this this week. We were talking about this very thing. And um, so if you like, okay, so I had a guy in the gym the other day. He's doing seated rows. I said, give me three rep, more reps. He gets two, and then he says a loud cuss word. And then he goes, oh, my gosh, forgive me. People do that to me all the time. I'm like, don't, don't ask me to forgive you. Ask God to forgive you. So anyway, he's, so he says, oh, forgive me in the middle of this. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not doing it. And so, but if you go back... But if you do not forgive others, your father, your father will not forgive your sins. Jesus points us to what's going to be. I'll give you another thought. All right. Here's the other thought. Um, what is the greatest commandment? You guys know this? To what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. There is no greater commandment than love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. But listen to the actual question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? We're not under the law. Does that make sense? But, so then you go on these things. Once again, Jesus is pointing to people to things that they really can't do. But when you go to the New Testament, here's what it says in 1 John. Here's our commandment, to love Jesus and to love others. And so when the love of the Lord has been put in your heart, that's what changes you. You can't change people with law. Only Jesus can change you with the gospel, and the gospel changes your heart, and when your heart is changed, then forgiveness, prayer, things like that, they flow out of your heart naturally. Amen? That's the gospel there, and that's what we're looking at in the middle of it. Okay, with all that said, here's the second thing I want you to see, or the truth in this. We have to learn to pray. We have to learn to pray. I was driving, I was going to the grocery store, driving home, and I looked to my left, and I looked into a yard, and these two little kids were, they had boxing gloves on, maybe 10 years old, and they were fighting in the front yard, and what they had done was taken their mother's, the fencing from their mother's garden, and made them a two-foot octagon ring, in the, and I'm like, only in Granite City can I see this. And I was trying to pull over and take a picture for you guys. I just couldn't do it at the time because there were cars behind me. But I was so excited about that. And they weren't very good, by the way. So, um, and, and here's the point I want to make with that. We're not very good with prayer. In fact, um, I talk to people about prayer. And some people, most people will say, I'm, I'm just not very good at that. And I'm like, well, it's just talking to God. But I totally understand that. Here's why everyone feels inadequate when it comes to prayer. Everyone struggles in that particular area. Um, the greatest Christian who ever lived next to Jesus struggled with it. Listen to what Romans 8, 20, let's read Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Here it is. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And so this is Paul. God wrote half the New Testament. And he's saying, hey, there are times I don't even know what to pray for. There are things that I don't even know what to pray for. So we're all in this school of prayer. Even the disciples, the 12 guys that Jesus handpicks to follow him, in his, in his entire ministry, uh, they didn't know how to pray. Look at Luke 11. 1. Let's read this together. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Now, Here's what they did. They watched Jesus pray. And then they said, teach us to pray. Think about this. These guys, they got to watch D Jesus do, they, they got to watch him bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. That's what Jesus does. If you want to see what heaven is like, look what Jesus does. He casts out devils. He heals the sick. Um, he gives sight to people who are blind. 
So he's bringing this, he does all these miracles. He raises the dead. He turns water into wine. Um, He walks on water. He casts out demons. All these supernatural, crazy things. Never once do you hear the disciples um, say, Lord, teach us to do miracles. He just, they said, teach us to pray because evidently they saw him when he prayed and they saw something that was really, really unusual in the way that he prayed, and they wanted to know that. So we all still need to learn to pray. Now, in your notes, second thing is this, prayer is dread. First thing is prayer is duty, second thing is prayer is dread. Matthew 8, 6, if you look back on it, it's not your notes, but here's what he said, for your father knows what you need before you ask him, which begs the question, if God knows what I need before I pray, um, why do I even ask? And so, and I really think that that question misses the point. We pray um, to align our heart with God's heart. We pray not to get what we want all the time, but to get what God wants. Prayer changes us uh, more than it does anything. And that's the whole idea behind it. And that doesn't mean that we, you know, shouldn't ask the Lord, but prayer really does change our heart. I read this, um, from a pastor. Here's what he said. He said, I hate to pray. He said, it shouldn't be so after all, I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to love prayer, right? And then he says, I'll say it again. I hate to pray. Maybe he hates an overstatement. Um, but almost always, unless I am in deep trouble, um, prayer is not my natural inclination. He says, I've always had something better to do than pray. I have a data plan, an office that needs straightened up. I have email that demands my attentions. I have books to read, conversations to be had, a sermon to prepare, a car to wash, a friend with whom I want to have coffee. These things I love, um, and they don't feel like work to me. But prayer, he says, prayer comes to me about as naturally as turning the other cheek or going that second mile. Um, And so he says, what makes matters worse, I seem to bump into great prayers all the time. And so for what comes difficult for me seems to come easily for other people. And the truth is prayer for each and every one of us uh, can be intimidating, especially when you read the Bible. You look at the uh, the Psalms and you see David. Um, He's a king with all these responsibilities, wars to fight, people to care for, rebellions to squash. Um, But he always has time to pray or write a psalm or do something better. Then in, in the New Testament, you read about Jesus early in the morning. What did Jesus do? Got up to pray. And so you see these examples. Um, if you think about church history, there's a guy named Martin Luther, who is the Protestant reformer from the 15th century. And he's just writing all these different things, translating the New Testament into German, um, writing volumes of commentaries, yet he spent hours in prayer. And so prayer can be intimidating. Let's look at this in your notes. The truth, our misconceptions about prayer can cause dread. Our misconceptions about prayer can cause dread. I remember going to churches before, and this happened more than once, um, and the pastor would say, I'm going to we're going to come in on Friday night and we're going to pray all night. Anybody ever been through those pray all night things? And so everybody gets there at nine o'clock and then by 10 o'clock, half the people are gone. And by 11, most of the people are sleeping. And the pastor one time said that he said they were, there was just a small handful of people left to pray. And he said, and I went up to the stairs and I, I, I started praying. And then the next thing I know, I woke up and someone had put a blanket on me because I fell asleep and everybody was gone. And so there's different things that we, we want to do with prayer, but that doesn't always work. So let's look at four prayer misconceptions. The first one is this, prayer is not magic. Prayer is not magic. In James 4, here's what it says, and let's read this together. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get 
on your pleasures. Some people approach prayer like Jimmy. Uh, Lord, my name is Jimmy and I'll take all you can give me. Not, not everybody does that, but that's part of what happens. It's not like um, Harry Potter. You have that Harry Potter thing where he waves a, 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 a stick and everything changes, all the circumstances change. Prayer's not a magic wand that you just wave it and all of a sudden everything changes in your life. That's not what, um, what, what the idea of prayer is God is not a genie. Um, you can't look at your husband and say, abracadabra, you're a great husband because it doesn't work, right ladies? It just doesn't. There's just a lot to work with that. Here's the second thing. Um, prayer is not a fire extinguisher. My friend Steve Brown wrote this in his book. He says, not too long ago, I was flying back from a board meeting in Toronto, Canada. Our plane landed in Pittsburgh one week after another plane on the same airline had crashed in Pittsburgh. We went through some of the more, most horrible turbulence I'd ever experienced. He said, I thought we were going to die. In fact, I was sure of it. Now, that's the kind of experience that has a tendency to make one's prayer life very, very intense. He said, the ir irritating part about my praying on that occasion was the snores of the sleeping woman next to me. When we finally landed safely, she woke up and she stretched as if nothing happened. And I said to her, lady, we almost died and you were sleeping. It seems to me that a person ought to be awake for their own death. And she laughed and she looked at me and she simply said, mister, I can't fly, I can't fly this plane, which is pretty profound if you think about it. And so, and it's prof profound about life because there are fires that only God can put out in our life. Let me give you after the letter C. Prayer is not a power struggle. Martin Luther, the reformer, he said this, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, but laying hold of God's willingness. And so what he's saying is we align ourselves with what God wants. And so prayer is not a tug of war that we have with God. A lot of people think that God really doesn't um, answer your prayer unless you beg and plead enough. Jesus told this story. It's in Luke 18. I was reading it this morning. Um, and he's telling a story. A lot of times when he tells a story, they're called parables, but he tells a story um, on prayer that is opposite of the idea of prayer. Here's what I mean. In some of the parables, Jesus says, here's a story and here's what God's like. And then he tells this story and he said, this is what he said, God is not like this. The story's in Luke 18, and it's about a judge, um, and he's an unfair judge. He's not a believer at all, but a widow needs justice, and she keeps coming to him and badgering the judge for justice, and he just won't give in to her until finally he, gives, he goes, okay, if you just stop yapping, I'll give it to you. See, and then there, that story's told. And so you look at that, and you think, oh, man, maybe I should be praying more um, or asking more. But actually, that story is the opposite because the story then, the, the, the writer then says, God's not like that. God will answer your prayer and he wants to give you an answer. So you don't have to power struggle with him. You don't have to battle with him. And let me give you the last one in this. Prayer is not guilt relief. It's not a ritual to relieve guilt. And once again, some of you grew up where you were taught if you sin, and if it's a really big sin, you have to say a certain number of prayers. That's what I was taught. Um, and so that what that implies, though, is that the cross isn't enough. You better add some prayers to it to get your sins um, ab ab absolved. And so prayer is a privilege. It's not a duty. And it's important to remember that. It's Jesus, he said this, don't say the same things over and over. Don't go babbling like uh, pagans. Don't use meaningless repetition. Um, and so he's saying that if you just come to me in a very real way. Now let me give you the big takeaway because all those things were kind of negatives. And I'm going to give you the positives. And let's look at this, this third one. It's prayer as desire. Prayer as desire. A few years back, I went to a conference with a group from Maryland Heights, and the uh, conference was in Alabama. It's called uh, it was at a place called the Church of the Highlands, um, and there's a guy who's a very good leader there. And in the Church of the Highlands, they have this 21 days of prayer, and they do this twice a year. Actually, it's going on right now, um, and it's an hour long, 
And it seems like that would be just such a long time in prayer. Um, and, and I read this quote years ago, an hour in the presence of, of God will reveal the flaws in your best laid plans. And so, but I love that hour of prayer. It's an hour long um, and they have it several times a day. I try to get up early and I can't make it every day, but I just love that. And I was listening on Tuesday and I was up early just watching and listening. And then they, what they do is they start off with a real small teaching. And the teaching, here's what it was. Um, it was very simple, but it was super helpful. And the guy said this, I'm going to give you three points. He said, here's the first point. God is for me. And then he said, here's the second point. God is with me. And then he said, here's the third point. God has my future in his hands. And for me, I don't know about you, but that, just that simple instruction is super helpful for me. My wife leaves um, this week for uh, a mission trip. And that always drives me to prayer. And it always drives me to buy new things. Um, some of you know that. Um, but there's a verse that goes along with that that I've been just... Um, just meditating and praying over. It says this, it's Isaiah 26, three, and you can, you can write the reference down. Here's what it says. You will keep in perfect peace those who mind, whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. And so, yeah, you know, I love the fact that we do mission work, but I'm not super excited about my wife leaving for three weeks, it's always a bit of a challenge. And so, so that drives me uh, to prayer. And, but here's the thing. We are all, each and every one of us, um, we all have this, this desire to pray. I mean, it's just really what it comes down to. And um, there was a guy named Martin Lloyd-Jones. And here's what he said. Never resist any urge to pray. Never resist any urge to pray. And listen, when you're going through your day and you think about prayer, one of the simplest prayers is the name of Jesus. And I use that all the time. It just, you know, you can add something to it, but I use the name of Jesus because um, it's powerful. It's God who is urging us uh, to pray. And so, and here's the other thing, and I was talking to Jen about this last night. We were talking about prayer, but we were talking, I can't remember the phrase she used, but it's the fallout of prayer. And here's what it is. We have no idea, you and I have no idea how God uses our prayers. We have no idea of, occasionally we'll see this. God will pull back the secrecy of this thing that we've been praying for, and he will show you that how the fingers of that prayer go out in other particular areas. And you see things to from a totally different perspective because God uses our prayer and then he shows us what our prayer is for. So let me give you the truth on this one. We are naturally, I should have used the word supernaturally, but we are naturally inclined to pray. So we're wired to pray. And if you think about it, everybody in the world prays. Um, Buddhists pray, Hindus pray, Muslims pray, pray, Jews pray. Um, the question is, who are you praying to? And so every culture is a bit different, but it's what makes you human. And listen to what this, this verse says in Ecclesiastes 3.11. Let's read it. He has planted eternity in the human heart. Here's what that means. What that means is you have a natural idea, a natural inclination to know that there's more to life than this. God planted that in our heart. It's in every human heart, the idea to pray, the idea to connect to this particular God that we serve. And so that's what that means. It means right here, right now, we look around and we have to go, you know, there's more to this than just what we see. And Jesus is the author of the story. And everything points to him. I'll close with a story. It's on prayer. Here's what this guy writes. He said, my mother had been slowly and painfully dying of a disease for almost two years because her liver was not functional, functioning properly. It could not filter her blood. Every few months, she would go into a coma, and my father, who was caring for her at home, would call for an ambulance to take her to the hospital. At the hospital, doctors would be able to treat her and bring her out of the coma. Mom's primary care doctor had warned my father that the way this would end was the day when they would come in and they would be unable to bring her out of her coma. 
Dad had just called to tell me that that day had arrived. Mom was expected to die within a few days. Um, this was not unanticipated, and I felt like I was prepared for it, but I was, I was afraid that our kids would not be. My wife and I had four children, a nine-year-old girl, a six-year-old boy, a three-year-old boy, and a two-year-old girl. I was deeply concerned about how this news was going to impact them, especially the boys. Amongst the things that my wife and I had taught our kids about God is that he loves us and that he answers our prayer. Neither my wife's parents nor my parents were believers. Every night when we prayed with our children, we prayed for the salvation of their grandparents. Now one of the grandparents was about to die without having been saved. I plan to explain to the kids that while God does answer prayer, uh, does answer our prayers, sometimes the answer is not what we hope for. Um, when he does not answer our prayers, we hope the answer he does give is always good, it's always right, and we can trust him. I was confident that our oldest daughter would understand. I thought our other daughter was too young to be impacted by what was going on, but I was worried about the boys. I feared th that they wouldn't understand why God would let their Nana, whom they loved, die without receiving the salvation they had prayed for every day of their lives. After we had talked to our kids, <clears throat> they all said they understood. I felt relieved that this was sad news and it was not going to rattle the faith of our children. Then we prayed, and when it was, when it was the three-year-old's turn, here's what he prayed. He said, Dear God, please, please save Nana and Granddad and Grandma and Grandpa. And he says, my heart sank. He had not understood. I feared that when mom died, his faith would be shaken. The next afternoon, I got a call from dad. Mom was out of her coma, and he was taking her home. The doctor had no explanation for it, he said. The following day, I called to check on mom. She got on the phone, and she started asking me questions about God. Her eyesight was gone. She could no longer read. Later that week, she had dad get the Bible on tape so she could listen to it every day. Every Sunday, she listened to a worship service on the radio. Every Monday, she called me with questions about the sermon. Mom, who had been quick-tempered and often angry, became kind and thoughtful. She was a different person. So we're invited to pray for big things, for impossible things, and we should never give up. Sometimes it's the Lord's will and people get miracles when they ask for them. Mom lived another year and a half. She grew deeper in her faith and rejoiced in the work of the Lord. She had been regenerated and become a Christian while she was in a coma. It happened when my three-year-old son had the faith to pray when everyone else didn't. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. God, we just, um, I just, just want to say a simple prayer. I want all of us um, that are here, myself included, to know you better. I pray that we fall in love with you in a way um, that we understand that you, the love you have for us. Um, I pray that we get to know you in a way that you have designed for us. And I ask, Lord, that you take that urge that we have to pray and just continue to pray for us and to encourage us in the middle of it as we continue to listen and to, to um, read your word. So God, touch our hearts. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. I'm going to have you guys stand. We're going to close together in worship.